In this case study, we're going to discuss the work of Gentile de Fabriano, who was a painter uh, active in Florence in the early part of the 15th century. Uh, so both of the works that you're seeing here are from the 1420s, roughly. And uh, on the left, we see a coronation of the Virgin with uh, the Virgin sort of bowing before Christ. Uh, you see the dove of the Holy Spirit hovering over them as Christ makes a gesture of blessing and places a crown upon his mother's head, signifying that she's queen of heaven. And then uh, flanking them on either side, we see angels with uh, scrolls of music. So they are obviously singing hymns of praise. And you might notice that they are significantly smaller than Christ and the Virgin. That is an indication that they are uh, less important in the hierarchy. Uh, so we call this either hierarchical scale or hieratic scale, when you have a difference in scale based on the importance of the figures. Um, on the right, we have a nativity scene that is also sort of a uh, virgin and child scene combined. Uh, so we actually have the virgin dominating the picture and brought way into the foreground. And then in the background, you can see on the left, uh, Joseph on the right, the stable and the manger. And then far in the distance on the left, sort of behind Mary's halo, you can see the shepherds watching their flocks and uh, perhaps even responding to an angel. It looks like there's a little bit of wear and tear in the gilding, and the, the one shepherd has fallen down and the other one is shielding his eyes. So it's possible that there would have been an angel up there at one point. Before we move on and look at uh, the specific use of ultramarine blue derived from lapis, in these paintings, I want to make the point that uh, if you haven't taken a course in Renaissance art, a lot of people tend to think of the Italian Renaissance as a period in which uh, scientific perspective was developed and uh, a very illusionistic and scientific way of uh, sort of creating space using geometric methodologies. Uh, but at the same time that this very sort of spare and scientific method was being developed, there were also artists uh, working in much more decorative and sumptuous styles, ones that have been linked to more the, the Gothic of the past than uh, these artists working with the new perspective system. And uh, it's important to recognize that both of these styles existed simultaneously, and someone like Gentile da Fabriano or his contemporaries like Benozzo Gozzoli were very, very highly paid to create visually sumptuous and expensive works like this. And uh, I want to call your attention particularly to the work on the left, which is as much about the coronation of the Virgin, the subject matter being shown, as it is about the sumptuous materials being used in it um, in a very deliberate way to call our attention to the richness. Uh, notice how the, the gold particularly dominates. And uh, the other thing that's happening here is that uh, Gentile de Fabriano is probably working for a patron in the cloth industry in Florence, which was one of the most dominant industries, and they were known for their uh, rich brocades. And so uh, that aspect of Florentine culture and the Florentine economy is showing up in this work. If we look closely at this uh, adoration scene, with the Virgin adoring the child in her lap, you can see that it's really beautiful paint, beautifully painted with a great deal of detail, uh, particularly with all of the little flowers uh, around the Virgin as she sits. You can see uh, elaborate tooling that's been done in the gilded areas of the canvas and uh, little 
areas where Gentile da Fabriano actually punched holes into the gilding to make patterns. Um, and then there are also little inscriptions um, on the, the hem of the Virgin's gown. Uh, so there's a, a really wonderful wealth of detail and lots to see that can reward a viewer that looks at this very closely. And if you want, you can go to the Getty Villa, to the Getty website and uh, look up this painting and zoom way in on it. I hope you notice when we look at this example that it is strikingly different from the painting that shows the Virgin in a landscape. Here there's no landscape setting whatsoever. Everything is happening up against a gold background. And then we have this elaborate green cloth of honor that uh, seems to form a rug at the feet of the Virgin Mary and Christ who is crowning her Queen of Heaven, um, and also sort of a backdrop to them. Um, and so it's, it kind of uh, makes the scene much more sumptuous and rich, but also serves to kind of flatten out the space and deny us from having a kind of landscape that we can imagine ourselves wandering around in. Uh, you might notice the angels carrying uh, scrolls of music on, other, on either side. And you might ask why all of this cloth is so elaborate. Well, one of the major uh, exports of Florence and one of the most powerful economic forces in the, the city of Florence in the 15th century was the cloth working guilds. Um, and Florence was known in the 15th and 16th centuries particularly for the quality of its fine brocades and velvet cloths um, in wool and in silks. And so here we have to assume that the patron of this work must have been heavily involved in the cloth industry um, and have been and would have been incredibly rich as well. Uh, the sheer amount of gold here is also kind of stunning. Um, we have a gold frame, we have a gold setting, we have gold on every one of the figures. The angels are dominated by gold. And as we'll see in these two works, uh, Gentile de Fabriano uses very different techniques based on the amount of gold that he's using and the way that he's treating the paint pigments on top of that gold. Here are our two Madonnas side by side. On the right, we have a very humble new mother, uh, a virgin who has just given birth to the Christ child, and she's in rather humble surroundings. Yes, we have gold in this painting, but it's being used quite sparingly. Um, it's very possible that the patron of this work couldn't afford to have too much gilding used in the painting, and so was uh, somewhat picky about where it went. Similarly, if you take a look at the robe of our Virgin on the right, um, in this sort of nativity adoration scene, she has a much darker blue robe on. And ultramarine, derived from lapis lazuli, is a uh, pigment that is translucent. Um, and it is most effective when it is used in glazes uh, over top of other pigments or other materials. And here it's pretty clear that to save some money, Gentile de Fabriano, um, po probably because he's not being paid to use much ultramarine by his patron, is using less expensive blues first in the underpaintings. So he could have used, for example, um, indigo dye that would have been precipitated as a solid and mixed as a paint pigment. Um, or he could have used azurite, which was an expensive pigment, but it was not expensive to the degree that ultramarine was expensive. 
Um, and he could have done the underpaintings for the Virgin's garment using those, and that just applied a final glaze of the ultramarine. The reason that I suspect he used these cheaper pigments is that uh, azurite in particular is known to degrade over time and to darken and also to sort of re revert to a malachite green. So that's very possibly what happened here. You'll notice that the Virgin's mantle almost looks black. Now if we take a look on the other side, you'll notice that the blue is vibrant and electric almost. And similarly, the green of that cloth of honor has a really luminous quality. And what Gentile has done here is he has actually taken both of these pigments, the malachite green and the ultramarine blue, they're both, uh, they, they're, they're both mineral pigments that are uh, rather translucent, and he has applied them in relatively thin glazes of tempera over top of the gold surface. And so the, the effect of that is that the gold shines through and uh, reflects the light on that, that uh, affects the painting. And so it makes these areas seem to glow from within. The red, you might notice, is a much more opaque pigment. And so you don't get that quality of the, the gold being reflected through it. Um, it really hides the gold. And you'll notice that Gentile is using that fairly sparingly. Um, but he's using it to give the effect of sort of a purple with stippling on the Virgin's mantle around her head. And then he's using it to highlight areas like her gown and certain areas on the blue brocade and the green brocade as well. We know exactly how works like uh, these paintings by Gentile would have been painted. And uh, in the Zeppelin Museum in Friedrichshafen, Germany, they have actually reproduced the um, carving, preparing, and painting of a uh, relief figure of a saint. Uh, you can see him on the altar panel on the right, and then you can see the stages of preparation here. Um, this is a, a 15th century figure. So roughly contemporary to what we're seeing from Gentile de Fabriano. Of course, we're not dealing with something that was carved, but a lot of the other steps are the same. What I want you to notice is that the wood surface on the left is first coated with a ground that will uh, make the, the, the wood accept the painting uh, more readily. This is probably a plaster-based gesso or possibly something like rabbit glue, something that will provide a good base for the paint. And the areas that are gilded uh, receive a red clay, um, and then the, the gold leaf is stuck down to that. And you can see that uh, the finest gold is reserved for the halo and the crown. Uh, certain areas are silvered as well. Um, and then, of course, the final version can be seen in uh, on the right-hand side. But what I want you to notice about this is that typically an artist would only apply gilding to the areas that were meant to show through as pure gold. So what Gentile da Fabriano is doing in that coronation image where it looks like almost the entire surface has been gilded before he did any painting at all, that makes it one heck of a luxury object. Uh, gold was worth 10 times the price of silver in the 15th century, and it was tremendously expensive. So to return to our adoration and nativity scene, what you see here is Gentile da Fabriano treating the gold in a much more 
uh, usual manner for, for a 15th century artist. He's not overdoing his use of it. He's placing it only in the areas that are really meant to shine through as gold, like the Christ child's halo, like some of the trim of the virgin's gown, and then the background with her halo and Joseph's halo. But it's not an, an egregious use of gold. And you can see the very clear difference between those areas that are gilded and the areas that are painted simply with other pigments as underpainting. Artists and patrons, so the people who paid for things, were business people. They understood what things cost. And contracts, and, and there are quite a few contracts that survive from 15th century Florence um, and from many other places, contracts tended to stipulate how much of an expensive material would be used and in what way. And so when we look at a work like this that is covered in gold and then the pigments are used to enhance the reflective quality of that gold. So the ultramarine in some ways is almost playing second fiddle to the gilding um, that shows through from it. Um, and similarly, that malachite green and that uh, really wonderful red on, uh, on Christ's robe, which is different from the, the, the crimson that we're seeing on the Virgin's gown. Um, these are all meant to, to really show off the, the wealth of the patron and also the fact that this person was so wealthy that they chose to dedicate something this expensive uh, to Christ and the Virgin Mary. So this is kind of showing off how much money you have, but also showing off how religious you are at the same time. And uh, again, it's a, a, a just an amazing work in large part because of the way that that blue is treated. I just want to finish with some zoomed in views here because when you zoom way, way in on this painting, you can actually make out some of the individual brush strokes that were used by Gentile da Fabriano in his work. And it's just fascinating to see. You can see where he has uh, altered the, the thickness of the ultramarine, uh, sometimes with a really heavy application, sometimes with a really light application. You can also see where he's gone in and given uh, a texture to that gold so that it looks like it is gold brocade cloth. And so he uses little parallel lines done in kind of a dark brown um, and also in kind of a yellow in order to enhance that textile quality of the, the gold leaf. Some of the gold leaf is also uh, engraved in addition to some of the punching and stamped work that we have here. You can see patterns that have been scratched into it or impressed with kind of a sharp tool. And so that engraving helps to give us that sense of texture. And one of the things that Gentile da Fabriano does in his work, and you see this in a number of uh, works from the 15th century uh, in Italy and in other areas, is uh, there's, there's a three-dimensionality to his surface. He's treating the gold kind of like a gold object rather than trying to give us the illusion of gold uh, by using different colors. And so there's a, a physicality here. You might also notice um, some of the areas of kind of what look like dirty varnish here and there, um, where some of the, the overpainting might have gotten a little, uh, a little gunk into it, uh, particularly in the detail on the right. Here's our final closest view. And here's where I think you can really appreciate just the, the mastery of material and technique 
shown by Gentile da Fabriano. You can see how he's using just little sketchy black lines to help enhance some of the contours of uh, the Virgin's mantle and her robe to deepen those shadows. You can see the really delicate brushwork in the face of the Madonna. He's done a lot of modeling in the underpainting and then he's gone in on top with glazes um, and then just putting little tiny delicate touches of uh, white here and there um, or those little red stipples. Uh, it really is a magnificent work and I also really like this particular uh, image because just on the, the sort of left corner of this slide, you can get a real sense for the fluidity of that ultramarine blue paint where he painted it on. This would have been ultramarine uh, derived from lapis, the highest grade possible, and then mixed with egg yolk. Uh, so it has wonderful staying power, power um, and uh, dries really, really, really hard and with uh, kind of a, a golden translucent quality. Um, and Gentile da Fabriano probably would have been told in his contract exactly how much ultramarine to use, exactly how much gold. There might have been an upper and a lower end of the spectrum for each one of these luxury materials. Um, and when you're looking at a work like this, the brightest blue, the closest to that pure ultramarine, is always reserved for the most important figure. And in this case, it's the Virgin.